Uh, you were kind enough to share with me when you visited months ago about your coming to faith. Yep. And a little bit about how that happened. I'd like for you to share some oh, of that briefly. Sure thing. Um, yeah, I, I, I grew up in a, in a, in a very non-Christian home. Australia is a very secular country, and uh, religion wasn't part of my upbringing. I can honestly say growing up, everything I learned about Christianity, I learned from Ned Flanders. Yeah, except I'm not joking. <laughs> That's everything I knew about Christianity I learned from Uncle Ned. Uh, so I did not know about religion. I assumed that all, I thought all Christians were just like the media told me. They're a bunch of moralizing geriatrics with funny, belie funny beliefs. <laughs> That's what I thought about Christians. Uh, and when I was in the army, um, uh, I worked with a guy who invited me to come to church. And I was... Yeah, I was at that stage of life, uh, I was just sick and tired of just doing what young army men do, which is just, you know, hit the town and chase girls. That was getting particularly boring, mainly because I wasn't very good at it. Um, <laughs> and so out of sheer boredom, I thought I would go to church, and I thought I might burst into flames as soon as I went in. Uh, but the first thing that struck me is this was nothing like I had expected. They were not, you know, moralizing octogenarians. They were, in fact, everyday people. They were teachers, they were accountants, they were secretaries, administrators, and that kind of a thing. And they were nice people, but they were weirdly nice people, supernaturally nice people. And I wonder, why are these people so different? And then I heard the, the good news of Jesus, his death and his resurrection. And in 1994, I prayed to receive Christ. It's been a different world ever since. That's the day where I, uh, that's the day where I left the matrix. Uh, and since then, I've gone on in my life, and God's blessed me with a wife and four gorgeous children. And uh, yeah, I, I did some time in the army. I then went to seminary, and doors kept opening, and I somehow got here. <laughs> so uh, yeah, I'm happy to talk about it later. But um, yeah, so there are people from non-Christian backgrounds who do come to faith. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, we have we have more questions than we'll ever be able to get to. Yep. But uh, we'll try to pick and choose here well. In Galatians 2, verse 7, there is a gospel, I think it's to circumcision, yep. and a gospel to uncircumcision. Yep. Are there two gospels? What's the difference? I think it's the same gospel, and uh, I'll tell you why. In 1 Corinthians 15, when Paul is talking to the, to the Corinthians, uh, he's particularly he's talking about the resurrection, and, it said, and he says, you know, whether it's what we preached or what the other apostle, we all, we all preach the same thing. We all believe in the same gospel. That's what Paul says in 1 Corinthians 15. And the whole thing about chapter 2 in Galatians is that the, the purpose of that meeting is to make sure everyone's reading off the same sheet of gospel music. Okay? And so they clarify. So do the Gentiles have to be circumcised or not? And they all agree, No. So the uh, gospel for the circumcision, the gospel for the Gentiles, that's not two different gospels, it's two different audiences for the one gospel. That's what I would say. Very good, very good. All right, here's a quick one. Is Lou Martin's end of religion, that's in quotes, Yeah. is Lou Martin's end of religion similar to Bonhoeffer's? Oh. Uh, I am not an expert on the theology of Bonhoeffer. Um, so I, could, I honestly couldn't say. I'm sorry, I, I just, I'm not acquainted enough with the area of Good answer. They Bonhoeffer. can ask some of these other scholars. Yeah, there was a Bonhoeffer, Bonhoffer <laughs> scholar around here at lunch, wasn't there? Was, a, was he still here? I did have lunch with a guy today who I think is a Bonhoeffer scholar. You ask him. That's, that's right. You might have. Okay. In the interest of particularity, or no, practicality, it's so tiny letters I can barely read it. In the interest of practicality, how does this empower us to be more like Jesus? Oh. <laughs> to be more like Jesus. Uh, the, the words above my pay grade initially come to mind. Um, <laughs> but that's a cop-out. That's a cop-out. You all know that. Okay, well, let me tell you what I think the payoff is of this. Okay. We, we want to read Galatians closely and truly so we can apply it to our context. And I think Lou Martin was doing a very noble thing. He was trying to say, what does Paul's message of the radical grace of God, how does that speak to our context? 
and particularly if you know anything about the mainline churches where they are a cross between Marcion and Oprah, you can see how this type of reading can be very powerful. But it's really the case of you know, baby and bathwater. Okay? Yes, what Paul is striking at is the end of human religion. But that doesn't mean we have to retroject all of this negative baggage of religion back into the period of the law. And that, that's my main concern. So the real issue is how do you be a faithful interpreter of Scripture? Because when you can do that, then you can be a faithful follower of Jesus. Very good. All right, let's go back to Galatians. Some, some argue that in Galatians, Paul is not freeing us from the demands of the law for morality, but is only freeing us from the demands of the law for justification. Is Paul freeing us from the law or just freeing us from justification by the law? Uh, we are undoubtedly freed from the law. That's his message for Gentiles. And, you know, particularly, I won't go into Galatians, Romans, you're now under grace, not under law. Doesn't get any clearer than that. That said, <laughs> that said, uh, the law can still have a prophetic function as it points to Christ, and the law can still constitute a type of wisdom that we should consult. So the main basis of Christian ethics is the teaching of Christ, the example of Christ, and life in the Spirit. Okay? That's the main basis of Christian ethics. But if you want to know what it means to love your neighbor, look at the law. If you want to know what it means to love God, look at the law. The law provides us some wisdom for this new covenant living. That's, that's how I would put it. How does Pauline apocaly apocalypticism reconcile with the Jewish unbelief in a hereafter? Well, it depends. Not, not all Jews uh, disbelieved in a hereafter. Some did. I'm sure if you go um, in certain modern Jewish communities, you may not find much of a belief in the afterlife, but the fact is Paul believes in it, and other people, for whatever reason, don't. Yeah. Uh, we will all find out if Paul is right one day. <laughs> and if you don't believe in it and you see a guy sitting on a big white throne, uh, you know you're wrong. <laughs> all right, here's a uh, little shift gears. Please elucidate upon Pentecostalism's role as part of the apocalyptic imagination. Okay, I think this is talking more about... Um, Douglas Campbell. Uh, Douglas Campbell is a, a great scholar. He's a New, New Zealander. I think he's a very dynamic and creative thinker. I learn a lot from him. Uh, I, very, I find myself very rarely agreeing with him, but always challenged by him. Always challenged by him. And Doug is very eclectic. He's got influences ranging from Lou Martin, J.C. Becker, um, uh, I was going to say... Um, and T.F. Torrance, uh, sorry, the, the Torrances uh, more generally, uh, but he's also imbibing some influences from some uh, Pentecostal theologians, particularly what they, what they say and think about the Spirit. I mean, the good thing about the pennies, God bless them, they remind us that the, that the, that the uh, Trinity is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, not Father, Son, and Holy Bible which sometimes we Protestants can do, so God bless the pennies for doing that, and they make sure that our God includes the third person of the Trinity. And I think what Doug Campbell is doing, particularly when he talks about the role of the Spirit and Paul's idea of salvation, he's tapping into that, that rich vein of Pentecostal theology and trying to see how it can elucidate theology. So I, if that's what the question is getting at, that's, that's where I think where Doug is getting it from. Very good. The Reformers divided the law into three parts, moral, civil, and ceremonial, and thus argued that the argument given in Galatians was not against the Mosaic law as a whole, but only against the civil and ceremonial laws. Do you believe this is a correct way to view Paul's use of the word law in Galatians? No. There is, there, in my mind, there is no question that that's false. That is a way of dividing up the law. That on, one hand, on the one hand, is quite useful. You could see why they could say it. But the fact is, law was law. Nomos was law, nomos, okay? 
Uh, they did not divide up the law into those categories because you can find ethical injunctions in places outside the Decalogue. And you could argue that the Decalogue, that's the Ten Commandments, it has, still has some ceremonial elements like the Sabbath. That's clearly ceremonial. So trying to divide up the law these ways doesn't seem to work. And I think you've got to go well into the Christian era before you find people dividing up the law in that way. It would, it would be so much easier if he did it that way, but the reality is simply more messy. All right. If the law is, quote, good, why does Paul write in Romans that Christians are divorced from it? There is a sense in which, as I said earlier, the law is bound up with sin and death. And the law is kind of like forcibly conscripted into this negative function. And Paul's marriage then is to say we are separated from the law and we're bonded to Christ. Not because the law is intrinsically a bad thing, but it's not the mechanism through which God's grace is going to be revealed. It's revealed through the Messiah. And what Paul is, what Paul is dealing with in Romans 7 more broadly is an issue because people could be reading Romans and saying, look, Paul, if the law is not what we do for salvation... If the law is not what marks out and defines the people of God, then what was the jolly purpose of giving the law at all? That's what he's dealing with in Romans 7. He's providing an apology for the law. So he describes what the law's true place is in salvation history. And he uses the marriage metaphor to say, yes, the law was for a temporary period, but we are separated from it, but we can bear fruit to righteousness in a completely different way. Okay? There is a basis for right living. There is a basis for doing and obeying God, but it doesn't come from the law. Because the question was, and people pose this question to Paul, it's Paul, how do you get you know, pork sandwich eating, idol worshipping, bisexual Gentiles <laughs> and turn them into holy faithful people? And Paul says, well, the law doesn't do that. We've seen it. It doesn't do us for our own people. You know, our own people have the law, and look what we're like. We can be a bunch of schmucks at times. <laughs> I'm trying to speak a bit of Yiddish here. I'm sh- <laughs> and Paul says, the purpose of my ministry is to consecrate a sanctifier people to worship him. And it is through Christ that that is happening. I am taking these pork sandwich, idol worshiping, bisexual Gentiles in Rome, in Greece, in Thessalonica, and I'm bringing them to faith, the obedience of faith in the Messiah, and they are praising Israel's God. Surely you can't object to that. I think that's what Paul is arguing for in Gentile, uh, in, in Romans. If you don't believe me, go read my commentary. It just came out, only twenty nine ninety five. <laughs> Makes the perfect Christmas gift. (laughs) I'm not sure we have that one, but you'll have to look at the list to see. All right, quickly, how do you reconcile what Christ said about the law and the Gospels? Quote, I have not come to abolish the law, but to fulfill it. Yeah. (sighs) The answer to this question is so incredibly simple I'm going to get Craig Evans to answer it for me. (laughs) Uh, (laughs) No, it's a very good question. And it's a hard question. And many theologians and commentators have reconciled it. Now, again, I I think what Jesus is saying, he is fulfilling the law put in its proper sense for its proper time and its proper purposes. Okay? And Jesus is saying that on his side of Pentecost, his side of redemptive history. Paul is exploring what Jesus has done and what Jesus has said, how it applies for Gentiles. Yes, the the law in one sense remains, because even now it's still wisdom for Christian living. Paul can quote the law when he wants good advice for how we should live. Even though he thinks it's not the main basis or the main constitution, the law is still there. It's still something that, 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 that points towards Christ in a prophetic sense. So I, I think we can bring Jesus and Paul into alignment, but man, it would take a whole another 40 or 50 minute lecture to go through that one. That's what I'm assuming what Craig would say. All right, here's a, uh, you can answer it in one word. 
Was Galatians written before or after the Council of Jerusalem? I think it's, pro I've shifted in my thinking on this depending on what I've had for breakfast. <laughs> I tend to think it was probably written after and Galatians 2, 1 to 10 is describing what you find in Acts 15. But again, I, if I have bran for breakfast tomorrow morning, I'll probably change my mind on that again. Okay, okay. Uh, another quick answer, yes or no. Did Paul serve in the Sanhedrin after his conversion? I don't believe so. Not to my mind. You can't answer this one that well. I mean, that quickly. <laughs> Could you please comment on the other two New Testament analogies regarding the law? Namely, number one, obsolescence, Hebrews 8. And number two, death of a spouse, Romans 7. Okay, I've already talked a bit about the death of a spouse thing. Let me talk about the obsolescence. Uh, I, I tend to use a metaphor for this. You know, uh, who, here, who here remembers LPs? Yeah, yeah. Your first LP I ever got was, um, uh, let's say, was it Billy Ocean? Uh, the, the, the theme song for um, Romancing the Stone? What, what's the song? No, darling, I'll climb any mountain. Yeah, that one? What's it called? When the going gets tough. That's the first LP I ever got. You might think, what's that got to do with the Apostle Paul? Okay, it's a bit like... It's a bit like this. I think Paul is saying, you know, the, the law is good, it's holy, it's just, even though it had unlimited purpose in redemptive history, but now that Christ has come, you've got something new. You cannot load LPs onto your iPad. <laughs> you get your LP, you try to shove it in there. It's not going to work. It's not going to work, is it? Okay, so the law belongs in one sense to the old age. Okay, so, start, so you don't try to load old hardware onto new, so old software onto or old hardware into new software or whatever, whatever we put it. The geeks can help me with that one. Okay, so that's the sense of obsolescence. Okay, don't try to load the old into the new. Very good. Okay, um, see if you can make sense of this one. Did Paul attribute a conviction, in quotes, did Paul attribute a conviction purpose to the law in that it defines a holiness that humanity cannot attain? And further, and thus require a dying to self in God's salvation plan. That's a good question, and that's bound up, it's bound up with another other questions. Um, for example, did, did Paul think that the law was incumbent upon Gentiles? Did you think Gentiles would be judged by the standard of the law? And it's, 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 a, it's a very tricky question to answer. We've got a student at Ridley, a, a lovely chap, who's writing his PhD on that very question. Certainly, the law points to the holiness of God, the God who is holy and is righteous, and he has the right to hold not only the whole world, but Israel to account as well. So it, 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 does, it, it does have that function. And Paul believes that by dying with Christ, he dies to the law. But every now and again, Paul will say something really confusing that I, I, I have to confess, I, I have no idea, well, I have a limited idea. When he says, through the law, I died to the law. If anyone knows what that means, <laughs> let me know. We could talk it over a Shirley Temple or something, because I... <laughs> Because I, I, I got nada. So there are some of those real hard verses that are hard to get your head around. But I, I, I don't think the law is generally incumbent on Gentiles except in a very vague sense. But certainly Paul says for his own biography, when I die with Christ, I die to the law. And that's where the spouse imagery also comes up. Very good. All right. Last question. Uh, take a deep breath. We're going to see if you've already prepared for next weekend. Here's a question. It says, what is the most significant argument against Ehrman's view of the corrupt transmission of the New Testament text? That's a good question. I, um, that's a hard, I mean, that's a 40-minute lecture, and that's a lecture with someone else by the name of Dan Wallace or something like that. Um, I, I just have to say, that, I mean, there are, there are many things about America that baffle me. Um, <laughs> 
I want to know, why, why is the cheese orange? <laughs> um, why, why don't you use the metric system? <laughs> who are these evangelicals who vote for Donald Trump? <laughs> Another thing about America that baffles me is some of the things Bart Ehrman says. Now, Bart's a smart scholar, he's a good scholar, but especially on textual criticism. But he has this view on the one hand that the, textual, the text is corrupt, okay, it's corrupt. It's been corrupted by the Orthodox, and he likes saying we don't have copies of the original copies. We don't have copies of the copies of the original copies. I spent my 37th birthday listening to Bart say over and over again, we can't talk about the Word of God. We don't even know what the original words even were. That's the only American accent I do, by the way. <laughs> he said that repeatedly. And then in another book, Jesus Interrupted, he says you know, the, the evangelists, they contradict one another. You know, then they're inconsistent. They're not eyewitnesses. And when he discusses the oral tradition, he uses the example of the telephone game. You know the telephone game? Like, you, part, you know, send reinforcements, we're going to advance. By the time you get to the end, it's send three and sixpence, we're going to a dance. <laughs> now, this is, what, this is what baffles me. So Bart says the manuscripts are messed up, the evangelists are unreliable, the oral tradition beneath the Gospels is, is messing up, and yet he can then write a book about the historical Jesus. He even knows what Jesus is thinking about himself. <laughs> I'm saying, but you said the manuscripts are messed up. You said the evangelists contradict each other, they're not eyewitnesses. You say that the oral traditions were not re reliable, and, and yet he's able to reconstruct the historical Jesus. It's, it's like he says in one book, the emperor has no clothes. And then in the next book he says, I love what the emperor is wearing at the Vanity Fair Oscars party. He, he looks gorgeous in Armani. I don't necessarily want to see myself debate Bart Ehrman. I want to see Bart Ehrman debate himself. <laughs> I want to see the Bart Ehrman of the corruption of the New Testament and Jesus interrupted debate the Bart Ehrman that wrote about Jesus the apocalyptic seer. And I, just, I would like to see that debate because I just don't think it can actually uh, really hold. So that's the thing that's most baffling to me about Bart. That cheese metric system and Donald Trump. <laughs> I've got others, but I'm going to stop there. Would you thank Mike, please? <laughs>